All right, guys. All right, let's turn to the book of James. We're going to be in James chapter 1 today. And so we have spent a lot of time in the Old Testament lately. And so I thought it would be a good thing that here, starting a a new year, to jump into a a New Testament book where we're going to get a lot lot more of uh, theology, you know, proper versus, um, you know, trying to pull things out of the Old Testament and use those examples. Here, uh, we're going to see it very clearly on the page. It's going to teach us a lot of things. And so um, the book of James is one of those books that I always enjoy reading through because it's so plain spoken. Uh, it's not written as a theological dissertation. It's not meant to impress the reader with big lofty words, but rather that it's very direct and it's very simplistic and it's just meant to get the point across. And so with that, I always love the book of James. It's one that when uh, when I have people come to me and they're new in their faith and they say, you know, what should I be reading? What do I need to start with? We always start with the book of John. We always start with the book of James. We always start with the book of 1 Corinthians. And so these are uh, wonderful, wonderful words that we're going to read this morning and learn them so that we can apply them. So James chapter 1, verse 1 says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded." unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but let the rich in his humiliation, because as the flower of the field he will pass away, for no sooner has the sun risen in the burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life from which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that he might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us just to come together into your house during this time, Lord, to look into your word. And Father, we pray that as we do, we'd be led by your spirit. Father, that it would convict us of our unrighteousness, Father, of our sinfulness, Lord, that we can repent of it. And Father, that it would reveal to us your right ways, Lord, so that we can walk in them. Father, we want to be more like you every day, conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ, speaking your truth and your love to this lost and fallen world in which you've placed us. Father, to see your name glorified and to see a grand harvest of souls into your kingdom. Father, nothing would give us more joy than that. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you, and we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, so the book of James, like I said, very practical, very down-to-earth, very direct in its, in its subject matter. So it's going to be very easy to kind of glean what he's talking about off of this. And, and uh, there, there's not going to be a lot of grand mysteries unwrapped, but rather just try to help people understand the plain words that are there. The first thing that we have to understand is who's talking. So this book is written by James, and James is certainly a disciple, but James is not the apostle James, right? 
rather, who this James is, is the very brother of Jesus. So this is Jesus's half-brother, James, who would have served the church at Jerusalem. And he played a pivotal part in early Christianity in that area, you know, in the Jerusalem area. He was kind of the leader of the church. So think about this. This is a guy who grew up with Jesus, Jesus being his older brother, and he would have seen Jesus every day. He would have known all 33 and a half years of Jesus's life. Um, Here, James would have been part of that. And then when you see uh, Jesus be sacrificed, you see his murder, you see him uh, be raised from the dead, ascend into heaven, here his very own brother rises to the occasion and begins to say, that was the Messiah, that was the Son of God. Now, how many of y'all are willing to say that about any of your siblings? Yeah, no, like, that that, that doesn't happen. You know, like, you live in the house with your siblings, you're very aware of their flaws and their failures. You you know their shortcomings, you know. For here, the very half-brother of Jesus to rise up and say, that was the Son of God, that was the Messiah, that was God in the flesh, that lends tremendous credibility. And the fact that James would be martyred for his faith in his half-brother as the son of God, he would be thrown off of a tall tower and then beaten to death with sticks in the streets, bleed for his brother, bleed for the name and the calls of Christ. So he comes to this to this revelation and this belief in Jesus, his half-brother, as the, as the son of the Most High God, incarnate in flesh, lived a perfect and sinless life. He comes to this conclusion, to this revelation, and spends the rest of his life proclaiming and encouraging and uplifting the body of Christ. And I, I really hate that we only have one letter from James, because there is so much good in here. A man who suffered persecution, who suffered such hardship, who had to show such graciousness and gratitude to other believers who were suffering and dying and being persecuted and being kicked out of families and were very much having to depend on one another. They had suffered great trial, great tribulation, great persecution. And here James writes to them to uplift them, to encourage them. He tells them right from the very beginning, he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete and like in nothing in And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So he's writing to a church that is suffering persecution, who's going through trials that are going through tribulation that are absolutely their daily lives are a constant battle and a constant struggle between standing for the truth and having to suffer for it, or simply being conformed to the lost world around them and kind of getting to eat by in some carnal camo in order just to survive one more day and not to have to suffer quite as much. And so he he brings to the forefront of their life that here you are going to suffer trials. You are going to suffer temptation. But he tells them that in the suffering and in the trial and in the temptation, to count it all joy, that it's a good thing. He says that the struggle is a good thing. The hard times are good things. That that here, this is something that we should be proud of, that we should welcome in, that we should look forward to. Is this trial or this temptation, is this hardship, is this circumstance, are things that we should actually look forward forward to. He says, because that's what produces patience. Now, in some of our translations, it may say the word steadfastness, because often with patience, we think of patience as just simply waiting. 
And you know, if we're if we're somewhere and they're taking a little too long, we go to the doctor and it's taking too long to get into the back, or or man, you know, we go and we sit down at a restaurant to eat and we feel like it's taking too long to for for them to come and take our order or to bring our food out from the back. Very often we will lose our patience and we will begin to act in ways and be rude and be ugly or snooty or all kinds of stuff, man. You know, so when we think of patience, we think of just simply waiting, but what he he's talking about is this uh, much more of this strengthening within one's self. It's getting that still spine. It's getting that hard jaw. It's, it's very much a hardening of oneself because we've been tested and we've been tried and we've been proven. See, this is the thing is that For many of us, for most of us, man, we have lived such a blessed life. And man, we've been given so much and we've, we've just had things go our way and we have beautiful families and beautiful houses. And man, things are just good. And we know a lot of scripture and we know a lot of Bible and we've been raised in it. And man, we're just full of memory verses and phrases and pieces of song that come to mind whenever we get to talking about scripture, we get to talking about the Bible, we get to talking about our God. And man, we can just have, we can just converse with one another left and right because we're so full of the word of God. But you see, when hard things come along, that's when it really reveals what we truly know. Because we can be full of a lot of, lot of just trivial things. And it can just be phrases that we've heard and we've never understood and we've never applied and we've never truly boiled it down to this is what this means and this is what this means to me and this is what this means in my life. I would say that you don't know what you really believe until you've been tested on it. Because we've all got theories, and we've all got want-tos, and we always want to assume the best of ourselves. And we think, you know, man, if I was ever in that situation, and my children, and I had to get between uh, them and the bad guy. Absolutely, I would do that. I beat my chest, and I'm, you know, look at me. I'm He-Man, and I'm going to be the hero, and I'm going to rise to the occasion, and I'm going to do this hard thing, and I, you know, and I'm going to jump into action. And, and man, we've all got those ideas. But then when the hardship comes, when the moment arises, when it's time for heroes to be heroic, when it's time for men to be manly, when it's time for, uh, for uh, people to be courageous, that's when we truly find out if they are what they think they are or if they're just pretending. If they're just kind of putting on a show and saying fluffy words. Because they haven't been tested and they haven't been tried. And so in their minds, they think that they'll do these things and they think that they'll rise to the occasion and they think that they'll conquer and they'll overcome and that, man, just just they will perform at their peak, right? Everybody thinks that. Yeah, this is why, like, you know, dudes will go and watch an action movie or a kung fu movie or something, and, and like, they've all got to throw a karate kick at some point in the next three hours just to prove they can, right? Like, everybody's doing it. You know, every dude leaves the theater with the action movie, and they all think, oh, yeah, man, I'd be the dude with the sword. I'd be the guy running through the woods with the bow and arrow. I'd fight the bad guy. I'd conquer the hill. I'd slay the dragon. You know, we, we get very puffed up on this fiction, and we think, oh, yeah, if I was ever in that situation, if I lived in that day, if I lived in that age, then surely that would be me. They'd read about me in the history books because I'm a big, bad man. I just haven't had a chance to prove Prove it yet. Well, testings and trials and tribulations are the testing of your faith. It is the proving ground. It is where it turns from theoretical into reality, where we boil it down and we say, you know what, this truly is who I am because in that situation, I did it. 
When it was time to stand firm, I stood firm. When it was time to square shoulders back and say, you know, I don't want to fight, but if it's time to fight, we're going to fight. And, and, and I proved it in that moment, and I proved it in that instance. And so the next time that something hard comes along, the next time that situation arises, guess what? We already know how we're going to behave because we've already been there, and we've already done that, and we've already achieved it, and we've already marked it off on the calendar and said, you know, what? In that situation, here's how I perform. Not theoretically, but experientially, here is how I perform. And so for very many of us today, we've been through the trials of financial struggle and hardship, and we know, hey, we just tighten the belt a little bit, the grocery bill, we get more creative, a lot more rice, a lot, lot more beans, um, you know, that, that we make it through. We've lost jobs, and we found, and we've worked jobs that we didn't want, and we've worked extra, and, and raked leaves, and mowed grass, or done whatever we needed to do to get through the financial hardship. Check, we can make it. We've already been there. We've gone through illnesses and sicknesses and diseases, and man, we were prayerful and we were thoughtful and we were faithful to God in it, and man, we glorified him in our illnesses, and with that, God healed us of it, and he's delivered us from it, and we can check that box too and say, you know what, man, in those situations, this is how we behave, and and we have testimonies throughout our congregation of various different trials and struggles and difficulties in ways that people have overcome and they've conquered and they've been successful and they've been wonderful examples to us. But the question still comes down to how how are we going to behave when we're in the situation? And often what comes along is little trials that lead us to the bigger trials. Now, this reminds me of the story of David and Goliath. And as David uh, goes and here he is just a shepherd boy, Goliath is this monstrous giant that has uh, a lot of blood on his hands. He has a kill sheet a mile long. And, and here is the little David looking at the giant Goliath. And while all the other men, including head taller uh, Saul, who was the tallest of them all, um, all of them are looking at that that fella too. And they're thinking, oh, geez, he's big. He's bad. He's tough. We don't want any part of Goliath. But then little David is sitting there and he's going, well, God's already let me kill a bear. And God's already let me kill a lion. So who's this uncircumcised Philistine? He's already been through the bear trial. He's already been through the lion trial. And so now the giant trial isn't that big to him anymore because he already knows the faithfulness of his God. He already knows the provision of his God. He already knows all of these things because of the trials and the tribulations that he's been through. So in the moment, the little ruddy-haired David is the man who steps forward with chest poked out, ready to come conquer the hill, ready to slay the giant, ready to go to war because of the little struggles and the little trials that he's successfully been through. So in the moment, David can say, thank God for the bear, thank God for the lion, because that giant don't look so big. But when we already run away from the bear, and when we already run away from the lion, the giant is always going to look bigger. When we slough away from it, man, when we continuously and continuously and continuously fail in the trials and the struggles and the tribulations, that's where victory gets more and more difficult. He says, count the trials as joy, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It produces steadfastness. It produces the strong jaw. It produces the steel spine. It produces great men of faith when everybody else may just be men of words. He says in verse 4, he says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. 
he says that the guy that's been through the stuff, the guy with the testimony that's already stood firm, that's already made those decisions, and he's been very resolute of this is absolutely what I'm going to do. This is what my God says. This is what my God requires. And so therefore, this is how I behave in this moment. He said that that dude is perfect. He said, that guy that's battle-tested and he's been through the ringer and he's come out the other side very determined with grit in him that this is absolutely, this is what is right and that is what is wrong and we're going to stand for God's righteousness instead of the worldly unrighteousness. No matter what it costs, no matter what penalty we have to pay, no matter what suffering we may endure, this is what we're going to do. He says, that guy's perfect. That guy's complete. He goes on, and in this testing, he's going to identify two things that are very important in testing. Number one is wisdom, and number two is faith. He says in verse five, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you find yourself in the situation that you don't know what to do, this hardship, this struggle, this circumstance, this this battle, this, this persecution, whatever it may be, it has now risen into your face and now it is part of your life and it's invading your family and your marriage, it's invading your children, it's invading your workplace. And man, you have to deal with this situation, but you don't know what to do. Here he says, if you don't have wisdom, then pray and ask God for wisdom. Because God will give you wisdom liberally and without reproach. Now, you see, the thing with wisdom is that wisdom isn't just simply knowing what to do. It's knowing what to do with what you know. So it's a lot different than just knowledge. Because for a lot of people, they're full of knowledge. They're full of information. And they know the facts and they know the figures and they know the, they, they know the things that are true but they don't know what to do with the things that are true. So they might have read the book of how to dress a, a, a wound in a field, you know, how to field dress a, a wound in, in, you know, uh, during combat. But until they've done it, all they know is what they're supposed to do, but they don't know how to do it. But the guy who's been out there and he's been in the foxhole and man, he's had to do the tourniquet and he's had to plug the wound and he's had to do all of these things. He has experience and he has wisdom. He not only knows the step one, step two, step three, but also he can do it under pressure when the moment counts. He's been through it. He knows how to use the information that he has. In the world today, we have a lot of people who have information and have no experience. We have people who have credentials and they have degrees and they have, no, and they have knowledge, but they have no common sense. They have no real world expertise. In that, they've kind of been around, but they don't know what to do with what they know. Here, he's not simply talking about a person who is ignorant. He's not saying, if you don't know what God says, then pray and ask God, God, what would you say? No, he's saying here that this is wisdom. This is somebody who they know the verses, they've read the books, they've memorized the words, but when it comes time to execute upon those words, they don't really know what it looks like in the flesh. They don't know what it looks like in the real world. And there God says, if you lack that, he says, then pray and ask me. He says, ask God who gives wisdom liberally. He will gladly show us how to handle the situation that we found ourselves in, in this test, in this trial, in this struggle, in this situation, that God will gladly teach us. But look, it also says that he will give us wisdom liberally, but it says he will give us wisdom without reproach without reproach. 
Now, this is, this is a great thing because here, not only is he willing to give us the wisdom for the trial, for the struggle, for the hardship that we're going through, but he's willing to give it to us without reproach, without holding it against us, without chastising us for it without roughing us up around it. Here, he's willing to be patient with us as we're learning and as we're growing and as we're struggling and as we're going through the hard time that as we turn to God and we go, God, I know all the verses and God, I know all of the memory verses and I can quote them and Lord, I can pray the prayer, but Lord, I just don't know how I'm supposed to act. I don't know how I'm supposed to live. I don't know how I'm supposed to take my next breath. I don't know how I'm supposed to walk through this time of hardship and this time of struggle. And so, Father, I know the verses, but how do I live it? How do I apply it? How do I actually do the things that I've been memorizing? How do I put feet to it? How do I live as a Christian in this circumstance? And God says, well, I thought you'd never ask. I'd love to teach you that. I'd love to lead you with my Holy Spirit. I'd love to bring brothers and sisters in Christ around you in this moment to speak the truth and love, to share a testimony. I would love to do that and that he will do it without reproach without reproach. Now, I don't know how many of y'all grew up and, and had a dad like I did, but I, I had a dad that um, he was the guy that had to fix everything, but he didn't know how to fix anything. Did y'all have that guy? No, it was just me. All right, all the rest of y'all's dudes were Bob the Builder. I had Toolman Taylor, okay? And so the, um, you know, but with that, like, you know, dad was one where it was like, all right, dad, hey, this is broke. We got to fix this kind of thing. And dad's idea was, well, you know, if you could hold the flashlight right, then it would already be fixed, right? Any of y'all? And is that, that's childhood trauma suddenly rising up on all of us over the flashlight, right? Okay. And so in that, you know, it, it was like, well, maybe if we just yell at it and hit it with hammers, then suddenly it'll start working. You know, like that was the, the atmosphere around trying to fix something that he didn't know how to fix. And so in that, he would even, as a kid, he would get frustrated at himself. And with that, he, he would, he would uh, begin to make it not very fun to help him try to fix things. Here he says that when we're in the struggle and when we're having the hardship, when we're going through all of this, when we cry out to our Father for help, he loves to help us. He loves to teach us. He loves to train us. And he does it without reproach. Without, well, can't believe you don't know how to already do this without talking down to us, without uh, guilting us, without shaming us, without any of this, because he's for your good. And he wants you to succeed. He wants you to pass every test. In fact, that's why he gives us the tests that he does give to us, is not for us to fail them, but rather for us to succeed in them, for us to pass them, and so that we know, I've killed the bear, I've killed the lion, I'm ready for the giant. So when I see the giant, it's, hey, bring it on, giant. I've already been through this. I already know. I've already passed these tests leading up to you. And guess what? You're not even a giant bear. You're not even a giant lion. You're just a big, giant, uncircumcised Philistine. I ain't that scared of you. Because our Father has already prepared us for the trials and prepared us for the successes, and he's given us the tutorials, and he's given us the training, and he's given us the easy ones, and he's given us that so that our spine could stiffen, so that our jaw could uh, harden, so that we know what the punches feel like, so that when we get punched, we're not taken off guard. All of a sudden, it's not alarm and panic, but we know what to do because we've been here before. He says that our God gives us wisdom. He gives us wisdom liberally, big doses of it, and he gives it to us without reproach. In verse 6, 
He takes from wisdom and now he's going to show us faith. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. He says that when, when hardship comes, hardship comes for us to get stronger, for us to be steadfast, for us to become tougher and rougher and more committed and, and, and more grounded in our God. He says, and in in those testings, when we don't know what to do, we can ask God for the wisdom of how to apply the knowledge that we've already acquired. God will give it to us in abundance and without any approach, reproach. He says, but when you ask God for that, ask it in faith. Now, we ask in faith because faith is obedience. Faith is applying what we know. Faith is acting out what we believe, believing enough to base our behavior by it. That's what faith is. So what he's saying is, is when you ask God, Lord, you show me what to do. He says, when we go to God and we say, this is hard, this is a struggle, this is a tough time, I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to be doing this. And so, Father, will you show me? He says, when you ask, you better ask in faith. In other words, you ask expecting to obey. He said, because a man who says, God, you show me what to do, but I'm still going to do it the way I think. God, you show me what I'm supposed to say in this situation, but I'm still going to say what I think I want to say. Lord, you tell me what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm going to just do what I think's right anyways. He said, that guy is like he's double-minded. It literally means it's like he's got two souls. Mm, think about that. It's like he's a schizophrenic. He, he knows one thing, but here when he has to choose actions, he chooses actions that are contrary to God. He knows God's word and he knows the memory verses. He knows what the Bible says, but when it comes time to actually put things into action, instead of doing what God says, this person is continuously doing what his flesh says or what the world says or what Meemaw and Papaw says instead of what the word of God says. He's a hypocrite. He knows to do good, but he's doing it not. He can say all the right words, but when it comes time to actually apply them, he ain't going to apply nothing God said. He can walk into church, and man, he looks the part, and he smells the part, and he dresses the part, and he says all the right words, and he can say, the, oh, yeah, thank you, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. He can go through all of the accoutrements, but when it actually comes time to be a Christian, he acts just like a lost person. He said, that person, they shouldn't expect anything from God because all they are is just talk. All they are is just a facade. All they are is fake. That's all it is. So they say, well, I would, I, would, I would go to prison for my faith, but they won't even go to church for their faith. In, in the American modern church today, Chick-fil-A has a higher view of the Sabbath than the modern Christian. Because a chicken sandwich store will close down business, lose millions of dollars to honor their God. The Christian won't even get out of bed. We've come to a place where we're full of bravado and we're full of machismo and we'll beat our chest and we'll say all of these things. And man, we can quote scriptures and we get high on our own supply of memory verses and Facebook quotes and pretty pictures on coffee mugs. And man, we go, I'm ready to conquer the mountain, man. I'll fight hell with a water pistol. And then it's time for us to say the truth in love and tell somebody that they're not really a Christian, that they're lost and dying and going to hell, and we go, "Ah, no, I don't think I will. And we shrink in the moments where we should succeed. And we cower in the moments where we should be courageous. 
and we're found faithless in those moments where God has literally put the ball on the tee and strengthened our grip and said, keep your eye on the ball and just swing. And we consistently fail. But you see, the the failure doesn't happen because we don't know what to do. Because he said he would give us the knowledge, he would even give us the wisdom. The failure comes when we've chosen that we're not going to do what God said to do. That's not how our marriage is going to work. No, I mean, that may be what the Bible says, and that may be what Christian history says, you know, but, but no, I mean, this is 2023, and this is how marriage works today. No, nope, that's not how we're raising our kids. I know that Scripture says this, but we're going to go this path over here. I know that this is what God says for us to do with money, but you know what? I think we know better than God. I think we're going to do it over here. I think, and so we're full of knowledge and information that God will use and that God will show us how to succeed with this. But even though we know all of this, we consistently choose to do it our own way, to do it in our own strength, to do it in our own wisdom, to do it in our own understanding. And we fail the test. And we lose to the giants because we lose to the bears, because we lose to the lions. Because even though we know to do right, we don't do it. And when it comes time to do the hard thing, we always find the softer, easier way. Because after all, if we did what God said, people would think we're weird. People would think we're odd. People might would make fun of us. There's no way that I couldn't let baby girl wear those clothes. After all, everybody else is wearing them. No, no, no. We have to participate in those things. We have to go to those parties. We have to show up at those events. We have to do all of those things, even though God says that we shouldn't even be there because we need to uphold our image in the world. We just want to fit in. We just want to do things out of one soul while claiming that we have a different one. We want to act like lost people the whole time claiming to be Christians. We want to act like the world the whole time acting as if we're strangers in this world. To be a stranger in this world, you got to be a little strange to this world. You got to be different. You got to not fit in. You got to be a little odd. He says, struggles come. Struggles come for you to succeed and for you to strengthen. In the middle of the struggles, when you need strength, when you need wisdom, you can cry out to God. He's ready to tell you what to do. And he's ready to do it without reproach. He says, but now when you pray, you ask it in faith. You ask it expecting to obey God. Lord, you tell me what to do and that's what I'm going to do. He said, because if you go to God and you say, Lord, tell me what to do, and he tells you and you don't do it, he said, that man shouldn't expect to ask for anything. Shouldn't expect to receive anything from God because it's like he's got two souls. Now, we know that. If, if I were a professional, if you needed to fix your car and I'm a professional car fixer and, and you say, Jonathan, will you come over and, and help me? I go, absolutely, man. I'd love to help you with that. And I walk over and I, we pop the hood and I look and I go, oh, well, right, there's your problem. Yeah, I fixed four of these last Tuesday. It's this easy thing here. This is all you got to do. And you go, shh, 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 shh. I think I know more than you. I'm going to go, well, then why am I here? Why did you ask me for help? Why, why did you call me over if you're not going to listen to what I say, if you're not going to do what I, what I tell you to do? Like, I will guide you. I will tell you. I'll be like, hey, man, there's a bolt underneath. You got to take off first. Like, I will step you through this whole process. But if you're going to shush me and do it, the, do it completely opposite, why would you even call me over? You're going to lose a lot of help acting that way, aren't you? Scripture says it's the same way with God. 
When we cry out to God and we go, God, you are all knowing. God, you are all powerful. God, in this situation, I don't know what to do. It's beyond me. But Father, I know that you've put this for me to succeed in. And so Father, will you please show me what I'm supposed to do in this situation? And God goes, oh yeah, here, this is what you're supposed to do. And we go, "Mm, I don't know. He said, no, if you're not going to ask in faith, expecting to obey God, don't expect to receive the wisdom. Don't expect to receive the, the encouragement. Don't expect to receive the victory because you've already chosen to fail, because you've chosen carnality. You've chosen the lost world over your faith. So as we approach in to the book of James, we're going to see a lot of this practicality. We're going to see a lot of this simplistic, just drawing us to a conclusion. But what we should see is right from the beginning of the book of James, he begins to talk about the struggles, about the hardships, about the rough patches of life, about persecution, about all of these problems. And he says that these problems should be something that we see joy in. Because every problem presented is not presented to us for us to fail, but rather for us to succeed. That God brings them to our attention and God brings them into our path, not so that we struggle and not so that we fail, but rather so that we can succeed continuously. So that we can become strengthened. So that we can become steadfast so that we can become battle-hardened, battle-ready men and women of God who have already been through the bears and been through the lions. So giants are no big deal. And he says that when we get into those situations and we go, God, I just don't know what to do, that our turn is to turn to God and to ask him for the wisdom so that he can use the knowledge we already know and tell us exactly how and exactly what we should do. But friends, when he tells us that, that's where we obey. That's not where we try to find a different way. That's not when we say, well, maybe I need to go and try to find six, seven different things. No, when God speaks to us, that's the end of it. And it's time for us to succeed. It's time for us to put the rock in the sling. It's time for us to step into the field. It's time for us to say, I've got this because God is, I'm on God's side with this. And this is what God has said. And it may be different and it may be strange and man, it may get folks uh, talking bad about us and we may not fit in and we may lose friend groups and we may lose uh, you know, jobs or opportunities or various different things. But in that in them anyways, we are trying to be faithful to our God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for your mercy upon us. And Father, we thank you even for the trials, the struggles, the temptations. Father, these things that come across our our lives, Father. Father, we thank you, Lord, that they're there for our successes. They're there for us to conquer Father, they're there for us to prove our faithfulness to you, to ourselves, Lord. Lord, that we can become resolute, we can be stronger. Father, that we can have the constitutional fortitude in those moments because we know what your word says. We know what your testimonies are. And Father, we know that you're faithful. So Lord, in those moments, we pray, Lord, that we wouldn't turn to our own knowledge, we wouldn't turn to our own carnal inclinations or desires, but Father, that we'd turn to your word. Father, that we'd be led by your spirit. And Father, that we would be predetermined to be faithful to you in all that you command us, to honor and glorify you in this life that you've given us, Father, and then to be with you in the life to come forever. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. And Father, we find joy in the struggles. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand?